The Pastor's Heart and Dominic Steele and uh, thanks for joining us today. A focus on youth ministry today and the history of youth ministry and actually lessons and implications for youth ministry today from that history. Ruth Lacabio has a new book out this week. It's being launched on Thursday. Uh, she's the Dean of Women's Students at YouthWorks College in Sydney and uh, thanks for coming in. Ruth. Thanks Dominic. Uh, the book is called From a Ministry for Youth to a Ministry of youth, and um, you've been deeply interested in youth ministry for a long time. What did it do to your pastor's heart researching this material? It was really encouraging, mm -hmm. especially I did quite a few interviews mm -hmm. with some older, uh, older people, and I always got them to tell me about how they became a Christian and what kind of influences there were in their life. And um, I always found those stories just deeply encouraging that mm. God has been at work for many, many years uh, in the same way that he is today. And so that was honey for my heart. Yeah. There were times, especially towards the end, where I, I felt, is this good enough? Am I good enough? Or that insecurity comes mm -hmm. in. And so for me, that was a bit of a struggle mm -hmm. in my faith as well, reminding myself of God's grace, the fact that I'm loved and accepted by what Jesus has done and none of my successes or achievements are really that important. So I think I, um, growing in my sense of my identity in Christ mm -hmm. was important too during the PhD process. Mm. Now, as I read it through, 1930 was quite a pivotal season yeah, or that, that 1930 decade. Um, perhaps you could take us back to before World War I, before the Depression, mm -hmm. and um, describe youth ministry to us at the end of the previous century in sure. churches. Yeah. yeah. So before the 1930s time, Sunday school was the key means of um, passing on the gospel, the Christian faith to the mm -hmm. next generation. So uh, there, was, there was no such thing as high schools. So kids sort of stayed in school to the age of 14. Um, generally, and then uh, then they became adults. So you stayed in Sunday school to the age of 14, and um, Sunday school teachers, it was a form of religious education. Mm -hmm. So it was very much adult-based, um, adults teaching children the contents of the Bible and waiting for them to get to an age. And they, they tended to think it happened when you're about 14, where you could make a decision for yourself. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, you know, the idea is that you'd become confirmed and uh, make a public declaration of your faith and become an adult Christian. 1930, we're coming out of the Depression, coming out of the First World War, and massive changes to youth ministry, but first, massive changes to youth culture. Can you yes. describe some of those changes to the culture overall for yeah, us? Thank you. Uh, well, one of the big changes was high schools. Uh, so high schooling became... Uh, Australia was trying to establish it itself as a modern nation mm -hmm. and realised that we needed to extend the education of young people. And uh, so high schools were beginning more and more, becoming more popular, particularly by the 40s, there were a lot of high schools. Mm -hmm. And so children were in school for a lot longer and uh, that led to this creation of a sort of in-between time where you're not quite a child and you're not quite an adult yet. And it's not a concept that the Bible knows, is it, that? that sort of adolescent -y, or is it? I think there is a bit of a sense of that, say like David, mm -hmm. you know, he's a youth. Mm -hmm. he's, um, he's seen as young, he's seen as still growing and still forming, but he, is, he doesn't have all the responsibilities of an adult, but he's not yet a child. So mm -hmm. I think there is little hints of mm -hmm. young people in the Bible. Right. Take us back to that 1930s time. And what were people identifying as the problem uh, and the mm. youth problem we, you describe it as? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was a few problems. One of the problems was that there was a leakage, a youth leakage they talked about, mm -hmm. that uh, someone would get to the age of 14 and do their confirmation and they saw that as kind of, oh, I've finished church and then they leave church. Mm -hmm. So it's a confirmation out of church rather than a confirmation into church. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of young people just leaving the church. Um, there was also a, sort of a genuine sense of crisis in, in the culture in Australia and other parts of the world as well uh, because they were heading towards war. 
Uh, the depression made it very difficult for young people and socialism, fascism had become threats. There was this sense that Christian civilization was being threatened mm. and we needed young people to step up and to think of, you know, sort of cut the apron strings of England and forge a new nation based on Christian principles. Mm. And it felt to me as if, um, uh, as you were describing well, really two parallel forms of youth ministry, one mm. kind of trying to help me be a good citizen of Australia and yeah. the other actually one where your concern is preaching, proclaiming Christ. Yeah. Tell us about those two different models of ministry. Yeah, yeah sure. There were two theological strains. Uh, the, the first one, so some of the youth organisations and particularly the Presbyterian Fellowship Association was really concerned about building a Christian civilization. And so they were, and the same with the SCM at mm -hmm. the university. Now, SCM? The Student Christian Movement. And that's a liberal organization. It becomes more and more oh, liberal so it didn't over start time. off liberal? No. Right, okay, no. yeah. It was right. evangelical, yeah. yeah. And even, they would call themselves evangelical, but liberal evangelicals. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they believe that we need to form Christian uh, citizens who are concerned for justice and building a Christian civilization based on Christian principles. Mm -hmm. So kind of a building God's kingdom now sort of idea. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the more conservative evangelicals, it was much more about evangelism and calling on people to become Christians and praying for revival that we can't m really... The, the emphasis isn't on making our um, society more just, but uh, helping people to be right in their relationship with God. Mm. And the sense I got from you was that um, uh, these new models that were laid down in the 30s have continued to be foundational right through to the 50s and right through to today. And mm, so right. help us see some of these... Um, new models that were introduced, particularly in the evangelical mm. um, team, if you like, yeah, yeah. for want of a better word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'll tell you about the, first of all, the different organisations. Yeah. Because what struck me, first of all, was suddenly all these new organ organisations were formed in the very early 1930s. Mm -hmm. So the, first of all, the EU at so the, the university, evangelical the evangelical union. union. And surprisingly for me, that was the formation date of the Sydney University Evangelical Union. You, you as a Sydney Uni graduate probably remembered that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, was there any Christian witness on the university campus before then? There was. The, the SCM was there. So the Conservatives were kind of a breakaway faction. They were a breakaway. They broke away. Right. They decided that there wasn't a strong Christian witness anymore uh, because the SCM was no longer... It's a, the SCM increasingly had issues about the authority of scriptures mm -hmm. and the substitution of atone, atonement. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, and their, even their Bible study groups had sort of turned into discussion debating societies rather than actually sort of studying the Bible together, praying together. Um, they'd, they'd really um, become very focused on social issues. Mm -hmm rather than Bible study. So issue, so group number one to be formed, the evangelical ministry on campus. Yeah. Yep. Next one. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and, and they break away. They went up to the tower, the Kulin Tower on campus, and put a little sign on the door, said, you know, a new mm -hmm. new group starting evangelical union. It's like they were like Luther away. nailing to the door. Yeah, exactly. Well, exactly. tell me more. I haven't heard the story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so she so was saying the, the other guys haven't got it. We're, we're preaching the truth. That's right, exactly. And it was, the leader was someone who had been in the SCM and had decided, you know, it was no good. Um, they needed to start a new, a new ministry, a mm -hmm. new group. Um, that, that group was very small and sort of met up in the tower and did Bible study and didn't really have a public witness yet mm -hmm. in the university. Uh, then the, the same thing was happening overseas. So students over in England in particular uh, in Oxford and Cambridge, set up these new Christian unions. And then they, they sort of thought, we, we need to be concerned for the whole world, 
for, mm -hmm. the, for the British Empire mm. in particular, and not just for ourselves, to have an evangelical witness amongst university students. So they, uh, they set up a new organisation called the um, IVF, the mm -hmm. InterVarsity Fellowship, mm -hmm. which you would have mm -hmm. heard about today um, throughout the world, and sent Howard Guinness off into the empire to Canada and New Zealand and Australia um, he was a student. He hadn't quite finished his medical studies yet. He was 24 years old, sent off um, to set up Christian uh, Bible study groups and Christian organisations in the universities and schools that were going to be evangelical, to be mm -hmm. an evangelical witness. So Howard Guinness comes to um, Sydney Uni in 1930 and meets up with these, this little breakaway group and together they plot um, of how to establish uh, a proper uh, organisation um, that will be a public witness at Sydney University. So they, um, and they call themselves in the Evangelical Union. Mm -hmm. And you, another m number of other organisations as well, Crusaders, Interschool Christian Fellowship, they're all kind of 1930s as well? Yeah, that's right. So as well as the Evangelical Union, Howard Guinness sets up uh, crusader union groups in schools, small groups of students meeting at school, praying together, being a public witness together, inviting their friends to hear the Bible talk, um, and so being that evangelical witness. Howard Guinness's vision was very much uh, evangelise and convert them in the schools, in mm -hmm. key, convert key boys in key schools that will then come to university and they'll be trained up at university and they'll become uh, prominent Christian leaders in church and the state. Mm -hmm. So it was a big strategic vision of how to change the world and how to grow the evangelical faith. And is that the key methodological change that you think is still driving ministries today or are there more? There are more. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there are problems with that method because it was some people call it elitist mm. because it does sound you know, elitist to it me. Does, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, but the the kind of methods that he used were really significant. Mm -hmm. So the small group mm -hmm. is really important. So gathering peers together to, to encourage peer ministry mm -hmm. that you are involved in fellowship together. So you need groups where you build fellowship and build relationship. Is that where you get your title from? from a ministry for youth to a ministry of youth from? Yes, yeah. that's a big part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Youth-led is mm -hmm. really important, that all the organisations were led by young people, not by older people, mm -hmm. and uh, that there was, that men and women work side by side, um, that that was co-educational mm -hmm. as well. That's what I argue that the model is. Right. Now, um, Massive change in the 1930s. Yeah. Um, then we had World War II. Mm. And what happens after World War II? Yeah. After World War II, the, there is challenges during the war because a lot of the leaders are taken away. Yeah. Um, a lot of the men go off, the young men go off to fight. Uh, and the best and brightest. The best and brightest, yeah, that's yeah. right. So they do, the groups do struggle a little bit, and there's also a well, challenge. Well, actually, you say a little bit verbally, but you said a lot yeah. in, in, your, um, <laughs> yeah. in, in your actual document. Yeah. I mean, as in your book, as I read it, you, there's story after story of difficulties there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and there's also a, a struggle within the youth organisations with some heterodox theology. Yeah, talk to me about that, because... You raised a number of issues. You raised um, sinless per perfectionism mm. as um, uh, how did that cause problems in the student ministries in the kind of late 40s and 50s? It, uh, there were some key leaders in the Evangelical Union, Crusader Union and the ICF movement who they started to read... Um, a man called Paget Wilkes, who had written on sanctification, but his understanding of sanctification was really a, a form of sinless perfectionism. So the way he read uh, Romans 7 was that that's the experience before you become a Christian, 
and really the experience of being a Christian should be victorious. Like mm -hmm. you should be victorious over sin. There's no indwelling sin. Um, that once, you've consec once you're consecrated, once you uh, give yourself over to the Lord um, in a consecrate your will to his, mm -hmm. then you don't need to struggle with sin anymore. Um, some of the students, the young people really embraced this and they became very elitist, like kind of like, you know, we've got this secret knowledge um, and tried to convert other people to their way of, mm. of reading the Bible and their understanding of the Christian life. Um, that became increasingly problematic. Mm -hmm. um, and Christians in those organisations realised we need to step in and stop this so um, there's a split, really. false yeah. theology. Not so much a split, but they're... But they're or, an, or a booting out. A booting <laughs> out, that's yeah. it. It's a booting out. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you talk about the four-square way of life yes. as, as being a controversy. What's that? Yeah. The Foursquare, it kind of comes from the old organisations like the YMCA. Mm -hmm. And the YMCA, more influenced by liberal thinking and liberal education methods, it was sort of a psychological understanding of young people. That to understand a young person, you have to understand them holistically in a Foursquare way. And the four squares are the spiritual, the intellectual, the social and the physical. So there's four sides to a person, it's a mm. psychological understanding, and therefore in your ministries, you should be helping them grow in all those areas. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a YMCA, this is why YMCA was so into physical exercise. Because mm. it takes up a square. That's right, it's a square, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and you would have, even in organisations like the YMCA that started off quite evangelical, mm -hmm. they more and more focused on the physical mm -hmm. and sort of left behind the spiritual emphasis or priority that mm -hmm. they had at the beginning. And uh, so there were certainly debates going on amongst people who were into youth ministry about whether Foursquare was helpful or unhelpful. And the more conservative evangelicals were, were quite sus against Foursquare because they thought we, we need to focus on the spiritual. That's our job. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter so much um, whether a person you know, mm. get some exercise or is involved in intellectual debates. They, they need um, the gospel most of all, and so we need to focus on the spiritual. Mm. So if we come forward to the 1950s, yep. um, some of the principles you're arguing from the 30s are fanned into flames in the 50s. Yes. Describe to us um, church life in the 50s amongst youth. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I think that's when youth ministry really took off. So, for example, in churches, one of, the, one of the stories I loved was the youth to youth missions. So there were these thriving fellowship groups in churches and there was hey, a... Hey, can I just jump in? Sure. Fellowship groups. Yes. That's, a, that's, a, that's an old fashioned term. Isn't well, it's it? an old fashioned term, but it's, it, you kind of argue for it a little bit. Yeah, you know, I like so it. Tell, tell me about the... Well, it was kind of like the formation of youth groups, but then the formation of explicitly fellowship groups. Because yeah. when, when I became a Christian much later, it was, it was kind of already old hat. But there was mm. a point when it was cutting edge. That's yeah. right. Tell us yeah. about that. Yeah. yeah. I love the word fellowship group because I think it's theological. It's theologically rich because what it expresses and... Uh, this sort of motto is from 1 John, you know, we have fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. Mm -hmm. That through God's spirit, um, those young Christians are brought into relationship with God and through the spirit, uh, they have a uh, fellowship with each other, mm -hmm. a, a deep relationship, a connection with other Christian brothers and sisters. So that when they meet together, uh, their, their goal is to build that fellowship to build their relationship with God, to build that relationship with it, with, with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, yeah, I think it's so much more meaningful than, you know, a youth group, mm. you know, that we're... So you're a pastor's wife. Have you been lobbying your husband to, <laughs> to reintroduce that terminology at St. James? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think it's <laughs> too old-fashioned, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> well, take us back to the early 1950s and that fanning, fanning into flames of those... Um, 
those principles. Um, what uh, what um, what was going on? Yeah. Well, first of all, like those fellowship groups, for yeah. example, they were um, fantastic. So what did what they did was uh, generally they would have a meeting together on a Sunday, and they would uh, read the Bible together and have talks and encourage each other in small groups. Um, it was really focused on Christian growth and maturity rather than outreach. Mm -hmm. But then once a month, they'd have a fellowship tea. Again, it's a little bit old fashioned, mm -hmm. like you'd put on your best clothes yeah. and bring some little cut sandwiches <laughs> and um, hibiscus and cakes and that sort of thing. But on a Sunday afternoon, you would have a fellowship tea and you'd invite your friends to come as well. Mm -hmm. And then they would hear, a, they'd invite a speaker to come and give an evangelistic talk. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing that they had that they did really well were house parties or camps where a fellowship group would go away for a weekend and they'd invite a good speaker to come and speak and do some Bible talks as well. And that was another terrific outreach um, where you'd invite your friends kind of on a Christian holiday and expect them to, to hear the Christian gospel explained on that camp. Mm, whereas we... If our churches are running camps, they're predominantly for the youth of the church families today. Yeah. And so that's quite a yeah. different strategy to today. Yeah. yeah. I kind of see them in the same um, category as kick. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if yeah, no, right. your, yeah, yeah. your group does kick. That That's often a time where... Um, oh, sorry, we've got people watching all around the world. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yep. yeah. Explain what's, kick. What's a kick? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's a big conference of youth group yes. kids just out of Sydney. Thousands and thousands of kids yeah. um, all coming together for good Bible teaching. And it is, you're, you're quite right. Um, people have such a positive time that they want to invite kids from beyond their fellowship group or their youth group mm. or whatever they call yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. And Kick has a Saturday night sort of altar call. You know, this is the time where they call people to make a decision for Christ. Mm -hmm. So it's similar on the weekends away. You might have a series of talks that would be good for Christians as well as non-Christians, mm -hmm. but a, you know, a Saturday night where you'd have that call mm, to follow Jesus. And so decision. you're saying the methodology of something like that conference involving thousands of people and loud music and that kind of thing yeah. actually <laughs> began in the 50s, which actually began in the 30s. Yes, <laughs> right. that's what I'm arguing. <laughs> okay. um, now, as I, I read your uh, book, you've, you've come up with a number of theses of implications mm. for youth ministry today. Let's just bang through them. Don't underestimate young people. Yes. I, I was really struck by the fact that the young people were expected to do pretty much all the work. So, for example, in the schools, the, the, the vision for the Crusader Union um, was that uh, the, the young people in, in the school were told, get together with other Christian people. Um, you know, you might be able to s find out who they are if they've got a little, you know, they used to wear a Scripture Union pin mm -hmm. sometimes. So the people who are wearing the Scripture Union pin mm -hmm. meet together to pray and read the Bible and then go to the principal and ask whether you can set up a crusader group. And then after that, you know, make a big announcement and then begin inviting friends mm -hmm. to your group. But it was just a lot of responsibility for mm. a young person um, they were the one giving the talks and giving the testimonies and organising the camps and house parties. And there was some training. Uh, they had drawing room meetings and they had older Christians who encouraged them and trained them. But it was the young people themselves doing the ministry. Mm. So, yes, don't underestimate what young people can do. And I think we do that sometimes because we've professionalised youth ministry so much. Mm. I was thinking as you, you made that point that... Um, uh, one of my sons went to a government school for the first half of high school and a pri private school, an Anglican school, for yeah. the second half of high school. And I remember him coming to me in year eight because he was leading the Bible study for the Christian group mm. for year seven to 12 and asking me for help to write the yeah. Bible study for yeah. tomorrow morning. Um, whereas when he went to the Anglican school later, mm. the chaplains led the Bible study. Yeah, right. And so it was quite yeah. a different model. And, mm. and, and I mean, at one level, more got done in the private school with chaplains, but he didn't get trained in quite the same way yeah. and have the, the same kind of pushing him out of his comfort zone to stretch. Whereas yeah. you're saying in the 30s, he would have been 
Yep. Pretty much doing it. That's right. He would have been giving the talk. <laughs> okay. Um, youth are not trainee Christians, but they're Christians. Yes. And uh, I think one of the things that really comes down the research is the importance of peer ministry. That is, um, you know, young people are not the church of today. They, they are, oh, sorry, they're not the church of tomorrow. They're the church of today. They really are Christians. And so the way that we do ministry with them and for them is that we encourage them to be a witness to their friends, to evangelize their friends, um, to encourage each other in their faith, to do peer ministry. Uh, and I think these are all principles that came up from the 1930s and 1950s. So, A global vision? Uh, well, partly what I, I think we need, we often just think about our, our local church youth ministry or mm -hmm. our organisation and its vision, but we don't think what's happening further in the world. Um, I was struck by what I mentioned before about the Howard people. Ginnis, yeah. the Cambridge people, that worldwide vision. And, uh, and also that the fellowship groups were much more into missionary. Um, they were very supportive of missionaries. So at these fellowship teas, I was surprised that a lot of the time they would get missionaries to come and give the talk um, because they had this real sense that becoming a Christian, you you weren't just calling people to, you weren't just, the gospel wasn't just you can be forgiven because Jesus has died for you. The gospel was you've been forgiven, Jesus has died for you, now take up your cross and follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that can, sort of this radical discipleship, be a disciple of Jesus and look for ways that you can serve him either at home or abroad. And, but it was abroad as well. So you'd be challenging young people all the time about whether they should be missionaries about whether, about how they're going to serve the Lord with their whole life. Um, and I love this sort of global vision that even for teenagers, you don't just try and mollycoddle them, and, mm. um, but you give them this vision of the Christian life that God's working throughout the whole world and what's going to be their place in God's work in the world. Mm. You, you, you describe thinking about the whole ecosystem. Is, what yes. do you mean by that? Uh, what I meant by that is that we need to think about all the different organisations and the different sort of structures um, that are feeding into the youth ministry. Mm -hmm. So when, when it was really up and buzzing by the 1950s, there was a lot going on. There were beach missions um, in the schools, mm -hmm. there was ministry. Uh, so kids were getting converted at beach mission or school. They'd go to university, there was ministry there. The university students were leading back at their schools. Mm -hmm. They were supporting the ministry there in the ICF group or the Crusader mm -hmm. Union. They were leading on beach mission. They were doing missions. Um, then the, the denominations were sort of had a part in the ecosystem as well. Mm -hmm. um, the youth conventions like mm -hmm. Katoomba. Um, there was just a lot of different organizations doing different things. And there was a lot of cross fertilization which actually meant to more and more growth. So it wasn't, again, not just being concerned about your own little organisation, but um, the whole ecosystem led to uh, sort of thriving evangelical ministry. Theology matters. You, you talk about the decline of the student Christian movement, the SCM, mm -hmm. and the rise of the Australian Fellowship of Evangelical Students, um, the EU, the, the Bible guys. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Go for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the key reasons I think that the more liberal, uh, more liberal groups didn't persevere, or you know the numbers dwindled away, mm. was because they were very much sort of reacting against uh, the the faith that had been passed down to them mm -hmm. to reinterpret and to re, you know that there's freedom in the way that we think about the Bible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but they sort of lost their foundation, their centre, um, there wasn't much left for the next generation after that. Mm -hmm. uh, and there wasn't a strong sense of identity either of what, what actually makes them a Christian. Mm -hmm. um, I think theology matters. The, 
theology shapes your goals, um, what you're trying to achieve in your ministry, and having a clearly articulated theology is really important and really significant. Um, to know where you're heading and to know it will shape your methods and how you do things. Mm. Now, as you look back to the methods of the 1930s that flourished in the 50s to today, there are some that you want to say, ah, this happened and we really want to hang on to that one and yeah, it's yeah. really worked well. And then this happened and actually we don't want to call it fellowship anymore. And yeah, yeah. Um, uh, what are the ones you want to hang on to and what are the ones you want to sort of let go of? Yeah, the leadership of young people. That's really important to keep a hold of. And we need to rediscover that a little bit. Mm -hmm. And the importance of small groups. Um, and camps, times away, they're really, really significant. I've been thinking not so much what should we not do, but maybe we should think of new and different ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. Like you were saying before, you know, the, often the things that we do today were established a long time ago in the mm -hmm. 1930s and 1950s. We're still kind of doing the same mm -hmm. thing. Are there innovations we we need to do and different ways of um, thinking about youth ministry because it's a different context. We live in a different culture. Um, our theological principles should be the foundation of what we do and will shape our goal, but the actual methods might, you know, change over time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I've been thinking a little bit about what's next for youth ministry, what what should it look like? Um, I guess what things should we let go mm -hmm. and what things do we need to embrace? And I think there's a lot of fruit um, in thinking about, okay, are there some more innovative ways we could do youth ministry, thinking about the importance of family and the importance of different generations coming together? Because these old models were very much about taking the young people off and putting them into their own little group. Mm -hmm. um, it was a little bit of a separation of the young people from the rest of the church mm -hmm. or the, the um, so I think the way forward would be to think about some ways of bringing the generations back together um, and thinking about new ways of doing ministry. We don't necessarily have to do the Friday night, we have games and a talk, Sunday we do more serious Bible study you know, are there different ways that we could do ministry to young people? Mm. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. My guest on The Pastor's Heart this afternoon, uh, Ruth Lecabio, Dr. Ruth Lecabio. She's just completed her PhD and uh, it's now just been published uh, from a ministry for youth to a ministry of youth. And uh, we will put the link to purchase that uh, in the notes below. Thanks for joining us and we'll look forward to your company next Tuesday afternoon on The Pastor's Heart. Thank you.